the Senate Committee on Transportation and Housing. Um, we do not have a quorum at this time. Um, however, we'll start as a committee uh, of the whole. Subcommittee. And, a subcommittee and uh, begin the hearing. And um, I, um, I've had a request to take item seven out of order. So I'll allow that. Item seven is AB 604. And um, Assemblymember Olson is here, so you may proceed and you have the floor. So let's begin the hearing on item seven. This is AB 604, uh, motorized skateboards for our members. So welcome and you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm not sure our witness is here yet, but that's quite all right. Appreciate you allowing us to go. I want to start by saying uh, thank you to the thank committee you. for working with us on this bill. We will be accepting three amendments to deal with impaired riders, adding helmet use for those under 18, and limiting the use of the skateboards to people 14 and older. The purpose of this bill is just to remove the prohibition that started in 1977 from motorized skateboards. Back then they were gas powered, they were noisy pollutants, and technology has really advanced since then. So this simply removes uh, the prohibition and allows boards that are manufactured here in California to also be written here. Respectfully ask for an I vote. Okay, thank you. Other witnesses? Other witnesses in support? Um, opposition? Witnesses in opposition? Questions of the offer from our committee? Any questions? Well, we don't have a quorum yet, so we'll have to wait until we have a quorum, and thank you. Uh, I will be recommending um, support for this bill uh, at the time we vote on it with those amendments. Thank you. Okay. I'm glad you accepted them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, we'll move to item number two, Canson Shu, uh, Assemblyman, uh, Bicycle Safety. This is uh, AB 28. Canson, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairs and Senators. For the safety of the, the bicyclists at night, as well as the drivers like myself on our street and highway, I have introduced Assembly Bill 28. AB 28 will allow bicycle to have a re flashing red light uh, uh, or a solid red light on the back of the, the, the bicycle. It could be either on the bicycle or uh, people wear on, on their helmet or even on the backpack or on a reflector of their, their uh, garments or whatever they're, re uh, they're wearing. The recent report from the Governor's Highway Safety Association on Bicycle Safety found that the bicyclist fatality increased 16% nationwide. That was between 2010 and 2012. And uh, California have the highest number of fatality of any state during that period of time. The report additionally noted that in 20, 2020, 12, I'm sorry, 2012, nearly 27% of those fatality happened between the hours of 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. when it's dark. And we all know that many of the cities are promoting the multi-mode of transportation uh, having a dedicated bike lane to encourage more bicyclists on the, on the road. And the bicycle safety is a big concern of mine. And also, uh, as a driver, I, I wanted to be able to go home at night on time instead of uh, 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 having an accident with the, the, the bicyclists. So this bill is supported by the ASME and the California Bicycle Coalition. It has no oppositions. And I uh, have, I think I have the unanimous mode, uh, vote in the assembly, and I respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any, um, any witnesses in favor of this bill? Seeing none, any opposition to this bill? Questions from the committee? Seeing none, um, well, hold on, we have to establish a quorum first before we vote. Um, we're, um, we have a quorum. We'll call the roll, please. Bell. Here. Bell present. Canella. Here. Canella present. Allen. Bates. Here. Bates present. Gaines. Galgiani. Leva. Here. Leva present. McGuire. Mendoza. Here. Mendoza present. Roth. Here. Roth present. Wykowski. Thank you. We have a quorum. Um, nope. There's a, can we have a motion then? Um, the There's a motion to move the bill. Do you have a, a close? Uh, 
No, thank you very much. I um, just, again, respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you very much for uh, presenting that bill. Um, we'll call the roll, please. The motion is due pass and refer to the Committee on Appropriations. Senator Bell? Aye. Bell, aye. Canella? Aye. Canella, aye. Allen? Bates? Aye. Bates, aye. Gaines? Galgiani? Leva? Aye. Leva, aye. McGuire? Mendoza? Aye. Mendoza, aye. Roth? Aye. Roth, aye. Wachowski? Six uh, votes uh, to zero, that's on call. We'll wait for the absent members uh, for the final vote. Thank you, Sanders. Um, at this time, I'd like to announce that the uh, following bills have been pulled from today's agenda. Item 3, AB uh, 208, uh, has been pulled. <coughs> Item 4, AB 338, has been pulled. Item 9, AB 828, has been pulled. And Item 14, AB uh, 1360, has been pulled from the agenda. They will be taken up at future meetings. Um, we have five items on consent. Those items are SCR 51, uh, Senator Stone. Uh, item 15, AB 1403. Uh, item 16, uh, Assembly Concurrent Resolution 4. Uh, item 17, Concurrent Resolution 14. And item 18, Concurrent Resolution 54. Uh, is there any discussion on a consent calendar? If not, can I have a motion on the consent calendar? We have a motion on a consent calendar, the five items I mentioned. Um, call the roll, please. On the consent calendar, Senators Bell. Aye. Bell, I Canella. Aye. Canella, I Allen. Bates. Aye. Bates, I Gaines. Galgiani. Leva. Aye. Leva, I McGuire. Aye. McGuire, I Mendoza. Aye. Mendoza, I Roth. Roth, I. Wykowski. Eight votes. Uh, thank you. Um, we'll go on to item five. Assemblywoman, Assemblywoman Bonilla is here. Uh, this is AB 451, and you have the floor. Welcome. Thank you very much. Happy to be here, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I am very happy to represent uh, one of my cities, uh, and the mayor is here today, Bob Simmons from Walnut Creek. Um, they're uh, a city that has 70% of their parking spaces are actually privately owned. And what this bill does, AB 451, is it makes clear the fact that, and it will put into statute, that cities do have the ability to um, have ordinances that regulate these private lots. And that's the issue that's in question. Um, uh, right now, we have a ruling that was challenged using an attorney general legal opinion, which states that California statute must expressly authorize these ordinances. So what AB 451 does is remedy this issue by providing definitive clarity. In addition, in addition, it protects consumers by establishing strong motorist protections in statute for all private parking ordinances. These include uh, access to fair adjudication process, a cap on invoice fees equal to municipal parking fines, and measures to prevent any private parking regulators from representing itself as a government entity. Um, I'm also accepting the uh, suggested amendments uh, to the bill, and with me I have Mayor Bob Simmons from Walnut Creek uh, to give testimony as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And good afternoon. Thank you for your service, by the way. And thank you, and thank you as well. Uh, thank you, Chair Bell and members of the committee, and uh, special thanks to Assemblymember Bonilla for uh, initiating this legislation on behalf of the City of Walnut Creek. The first parking meter, meter in America was installed on July 16, 1935 in Oklahoma City. Nearly uh, exactly one month shy of 80 years ago. The first parking meter in Walnut Creek was installed in 1946, about 70 years ago. So we've been in the parking business for a very, very long time. In 1999, we adopted the ordinance under which we made available private land for public parking it is working very, very well in our city. It is an essential part of how our downtown really functions, that we have that much parking available for people who want to come to visit, come to recreate, come to dine, and come to shop, or even come to work. Uh, we really do appreciate uh, the, uh, this legislation and um, hope that the uh, committee will, will approve it, and I ask for your aye vote. Thank you. Other witnesses in favor? 
Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, Trent Smith, on behalf of Regional Parking, Inc. They are uh, one of the companies that provides the services that are uh, the subject of this bill and, and strong support. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members, David Jones, on behalf of the Marin County Mayors, uh, Mayors and Council members, uh, in strong support. Again, scarce parking, and this is a good solution we think will work for us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, are you accepting the committee amendments? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions of the of the committee members? Um, do we have any opposition for this bill? Any opposition? I see none on the opposition. Uh, can we have a close? Would you like to close? I would respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you. Um, we have a motion on this one. Okay, we have a motion. Call the roll, please. The motion is to pass as amended. Senators Bell. Aye. Bell, I. Canella. Aye. Canella, I. Allen. Bates. Aye. Bates, I. Gaines. Galgiani. Leva. Aye. Leva, I. McGuire. Aye. McGuire, I. Mendoza. Aye. Mendoza, I. Roth. Aye. Roth, I. Wykowski. That's it, Chair. We'll put it on call for other members to vote. Um, members, we heard um, item seven already uh, in the Committee of the Whole before we had a quorum. Um, we are. Um, uh, recommending approval of this with three amendments uh, accepted by the author. Can I have a motion to that effect? Yes. Okay, that's item seven. Okay, we have a motion on that item. Why don't we call the roll? The motion is to pass as amended. Senators Bell. Aye. Bell, aye. Canella. Aye. Canella, aye. Allen. Bates. Aye. Bates, aye. Gaines. Galgiani. <coughs> Leva. Aye. Leva, aye. McGuire. Aye. McGuire, aye. Mendoza. Aye. Mendoza, aye. Roth. Aye. Roth, aye. Wykowski. Thank you. That's, uh, that has a zero vote, and that will be based on call for other members to vote. Um, we'll move on. We see an author in the audience, so uh, Assembly Member Gaines, you are here, and you can take the opportunity to jump ahead of those absent authors to present your bill. So that will be item 11, AB 1024. Assembly Member, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. AB 1024 modernizes current law by amending the requirements to become an operator of any driver's education program that does not offer behind the wheel training. Current law imposes certain licensure requirements on owners, operators, and instructors of driver's education programs, in addition to requiring 2,000 hours of behind the wheel teaching experience for operators. This 2,000-hour requirement made sense at a time when students commonly received their driver's education and driver's training through the same brick-and-mortar entity. Since more students are now taking their driver's education over the Internet, it no longer makes sense for, any, for operators who operate only driver's education to have a 2,000-hour behind-the-wheel training requirement, particularly when many operators don't offer behind-the-wheel training. AB 1024 eliminates this 2,000-hour requirement for operators who offer no behind-the-wheel education and instead replace it with a 60-hour instruction requirement, which includes 20 hours of behind-the-wheel training per the committee's suggested amendments, which I'm prepared to accept. I would respectfully request an aye vote, and with me today is Mike Belote to answer any questions that you have. Okay, thank you. Uh, Speaker is in favor. Thank you. Mr. Chair, Mike Belowd, on behalf of the Distance Learning Company, the sponsor of the bill. Uh, the analysis lays out the current statutory regime quite clearly. There's a three-tier system with requirements on the owners of these businesses, the operators, and the instructors. Um, and each has their own individual requirements. The anomaly in the law is that you need 2,000 hours of behind-the-wheel instruction which the opponents acknowledge is about two years of activity, even if your driver's education program, which is typically online these days, offers no behind the wheel instruction at all. So we've replaced that with the same requirement that applies to instructors, that is 60 hours at the committee's suggestion. We're not attempting to get any advantage on the classroom providers, but this isn't a safety issue. The safety issue is that the DMV approves these courses, and they're typically taken in about two-thirds of the cases by people online who have virtually no student contact whatever. The, it, this is an anachronistic area of the law. The opposition uh, which, who, with whom we have met 
is concerned about proliferating uh, licensees. And we would respectfully suggest that more licensees mean more consumer choice, not less. Uh, there is no student safety issue here. And uh, that the market will determine how many licensees the, uh, the uh, system can bear. So we don't see a reason why you should spend 2,000 hours behind the wheel teaching people when your sole method of instruction is uh, online. So with that, we would ask for an I vote. I have with me Steve Soldis, the president of the company, if there are any questions, uh, particularly after the opposition testifies. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, any additional speakers in favor of this bill? Opposition to this bill, please. Come forward, welcome. Come up here. Um, I'm John Arriago on behalf of the uh, DriversEd.com and the uh, Driver School Association, and uh, we do have some very serious concerns about this bill. Uh, and uh, I brought with me the uh, president of the California Association of Driver School, who represents more than 600 schools here statewide, uh, as well as the uh, largest uh, driver's uh, school operator in the state of California, uh, Gary Sefra. So with that, I think we'd start out with uh, Josh. Uh, uh, I represent the Driving School Association of California. We are uh, the 601 driving schools currently licensed within the state. Um, we have some specific concerns with this bill. Our first specific concern is we do feel that there is a bit of a mischaracterization of the specific responsibilities that a driving school operator has within a driving school. Uh, we do feel that there's a bit of a downplay of, of the specific responsibilities. Currently, a driving school operates with three critical components. A driving school owner who is responsible for the business and finance aspect of operating the driving school. They meet payroll, they make sure that the bills are paid and that the company is making a profit. Below them is the driving school operator. And the driving school operator is, is not an administrative function in a, in a business sense. A driving school operator is solely personally responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of that school and ensuring that that school is not only acting in accordance with the Department of Motor Vehicles rules and regulations pertaining to driving schools, but also ensuring that that driving school is providing a curriculum consistent with the Department of Motor Vehicles guidelines and the, the curriculum that has been approved for delivery by the department. The driving school operator is solely responsible for every certificate of completion that that driving school uh, issues to students that complete the program. Uh, they are the only person in that school that can actually order and issue certificates. Uh, they can call the DMV and order them in groups of a thousand. They have significant content and curriculum responsibility within the driving school that we feel is really missing uh, within the analysis of the bill. Uh, while they may not have person-to-person -person contact with the students moving through the program, they are in fact in charge of the content of that program, which while not a face-to-face -face interaction is certainly a level of, of interaction with students through the content delivery of the program. We do feel that there, there's a distinction that's attempting to be drawn here uh, between what they call a brick and mortar school and online operators that simply doesn't exist in reality. Uh, the reality is that driver's education is solely intended to prepare a teenager for behind the wheel training and that it is absolutely essential that the driver's education providers have a solid background in driver training, that they understand what it entails to teach a person to drive, that they understand what's going to be expected of a student in behind the wheel training, so that they can in turn ensure that the curriculum that's being delivered through their online driver's education program or classroom driver's education program is preparing the students for that next step. They are the primary, the chief educator inside a driving school. You can't have driver education without an educator. The idea that you could take a 2,000 hour requirement, which does in fact represent roughly two years of experience, and condense that down to a, a 60 hour program, just it doesn't seem to strike true. Uh, it is essential that these operators understand what it is that they're preparing teenagers to do. And they're preparing them to drive a car. Uh, 
The supporters of the bill would uh, tell you that they don't put anyone on the road, but that's exactly what they do, is they're putting drivers on the road. Before they take driver's education, a teenager cannot drive a car. After they take driver's education, the teenager can obtain a learner's permit and drive a car. It is essential, in our opinion, that these operators be properly qualified. We also have a concern that with such a drastic reduction in the requirement, uh, that there, there is simply the potential for, uh, for fraud. Uh, currently, the driving school operator is really acting in reality almost as an agent of the DMV inside the driving school. Because they are personally accountable for the curriculum that's being provided to the students, uh, their license is, is really at risk. Now, if I'm an operator of a driving school and I have 2,000 hours of experience, I've spent two years dedicating myself to the, the teaching of, of teenagers, I have a significant incentive to ensure that my school is providing the correct cur curriculum and is enacting in accordance with the laws. If I have spent a week and a half, which is what a 60-hour program is, that's a 40-hour classroom and 20 hours behind the wheel. If I've spent a week and a half to obtain my operator's license, I don't have as much at risk. Uh, there's less of an incentive for me to ensure that that driving school is being operated correctly. It's important to remember that the DMV does approve curriculums, but they approve the curriculum of classroom driver's education as well. They approve, approve the curriculum of behind the wheel driver's education, but they still require that that curriculum be implemented and supervised by a qualified driving school operator. The approval process happens on one point in time. Whether or not that curriculum continues to be delivered consistently at that high level of quality and improves over time is the personal responsibility of the driving school operator. And we feel that it's essential that that operator be an educator, be someone that has taught actual students. It's not an administrative function, it really is an education function. Okay. And we, we see it as a risk to public safety to, to see it any other way. Okay, thank you. Uh, other speakers in favor? Opposition? Yeah, opposition. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Chair and members. Please be brief, okay? Thank you. In the interest of time, my name is Gary Sifferin. I'm one of the original founders of DriversEd.com and I'm currently the Chief Strategy Officer for eDriving. Uh, e We're the largest provider of online driver's education as well as the largest behind the wheel provider here in California. Uh, this is in some sense a solution in search of a problem. In, in, in our organization, for example, we have more than 50 instructors that would qualify for being operators. Um, and proliferation of, uh, the possibility of proliferation of online courses means something different on the internet when you can, when it's possible to cut and paste courses and to reskin them. And if the license for, with the DMV is easy to obtain, 60 hours as opposed to 2,000 hours, uh, then it's, uh, uh, it, it opens the door for fraud because one can be a bad actor, not act in accord with the requirements of the DMV, and then just get a new license. Okay, thank you. Um, any other speakers opposing the bill, please? And seeing none, um, uh, perhaps the uh, author can author any comments in response. And Steve, would you, would you like to respond to some well, of those? I heard you say you'd like to respond, or Mike Below. Well, the curriculum is approved by the Department of Motor Vehicles. It goes out over the internet. There's virtually no student contact, whatever. Once in a while, a question comes in, and the instructor or the operator can respond. The instructor is, in theory, the person with the point of contact with the student. And we are not changing the instructor requirement. We are aligning that between operator and instructor. Uh, what this is about, in my opinion, is competition. And it's this proliferation idea that you will open up the door to more licenses. And that, respectfully, is not a public policy question. That is an economics question. Uh, so with that, uh, okay. I would, would be happy to respond to any specific questions that the committee might have. OK, thank you. Um, and the author has accepted committee amendments, yes. correct? Yes. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Um, uh, Senator Leva has got a question over here. Good afternoon. I have two questions. One, I, I want to make sure I understand this 60-hour um, requirement. Would that only be for Internet driving schools, or would Internet and <clears throat> brick-and-mortar schools reduce the 2,000-hour requirement for operators 
down to 60 hours. It would apply to any driver's ed program that does not offer behind the wheel instruction. It does not so offer the 2000 hours okay. would still apply if you're getting behind the wheel. Okay, thank you. And my other question is, I was just curious why only one driving school supports it and there are so many that don't. Um, we had a coalition of driver schools, uh, internet driver schools that kind of fell apart. It's, we are an online program. They're, they're the driver school association. They, they took an opposed position. Okay, thank you. Other questions, Senator Roth. Uh, just a couple, where, um, where is the DMV on this? Has the DMV taken a position? Second question, um, we're talking about classroom instruction, right? Whether it's in person or on the web. So I guess for the opposition, I'm sort of bothered by this. We're not talking about, we're not talking about driving. Um, I think my mic fell off. Yeah. Um, okay. What's the correlation between behind the wheel experience, the 2000 hours, for example, and the quality of your or your ability to, to teach in a classroom environment. Does, are you saying that 2,000 hours behind the wheel makes you a better classroom teacher than somebody who spent 1,000 hours or somebody who spent 500 hours or somebody who spent 100? Yes, yes, absolutely. Is there any empirical data to, to demonstrate that? I don't know that we have empirical data to support that. Uh, certainly as a, an instructor, you know, your experience gained behind the wheel is critical, not just in, in your behind the wheel training, but in your driver's education program. The idea that we, we have two different things going on, that we have driver education and then we have behind the wheel and these are not the same is I think incorrect. It's, we're all talking about driving, whether or not we're providing that in an education program or we're providing it behind the wheel, we're teaching them essential laws and rules of the road and also driving uh, techniques and best driving practices. Uh, so the idea that we could have someone operating that school that doesn't know what happens in the second half of it, just it doesn't seem right. Um, well, that's a different question, isn't it? Okay. So the issue is, should we allow driving programs in the state of California that just consist of classroom instruction? Right. Or should we require drive, all driving programs have both classroom instruction and behind the wheel instruction? I mean, that's a different issue. What we're dealing with here is, assuming you allow mm -hmm. driving instruction programs that are simply classroom programs, right. what is it that it takes for somebody to run and operate one of those programs that is focused strictly on classroom instruction, whether it's in person or on the internet, right. conveying information mm -hmm. much as you would have in a K through 14 setting. Mm -hmm. So isn't most of the classroom instruction, doesn't most of it pertain to the rules of the road and the DMV's rules? And you can look at my hair and tell that it's been decades <laughs> since I've done this, but <laughs> am I not right? We believe that it is it is essential to understand that driver's education is the sole purpose is to prepare the student for behind the wheel training. And that is, as, as that is the case, as driver's education is to prepare a student to get in a car and drive, we believe that the person that is, is delivering that and operating that program should understand what behind the wheel training consists of, which is, is where that 2,000 hour requirement comes in. Now, is there an alternative to that? We don't know. We also believe that the driving school industry should not be regulating itself, whether that be an individual school or, or our association. We really depend on the Department of Motor Vehicles to act as a regulating agency. And um, I would put that question to them. Is a thousand hours sufficient? I don't know. I think the Department of Motor Vehicles should really make that decision and not a driving school. Mr. Chair, one final question. So uh, maybe it's in here and I missed it, but what's the length? What's the course length for the classroom instruction? And that's 30 hours, which is 25 hours of education and, and five hours of break periods involved. Okay, so out of the 25 hours in the classroom or on the computer, mm -hmm. what portion of it uh, pertains to tips of the road as, a fo as opposed to instruction on the DMV rules and parking sign, I mean, signage and... Well, well, all of those things would be rules of the road. But I, I don't well, think that I there's meant, a, a separation I'm, there. I meant driving, too. You know, 
when you talk about driving experience yeah. and the need for driving experience, mm -hmm. you're talking about the application of practical experience to the classroom, which would be, right. this is what the rule says, but this is how you should deal with the rule when you're behind the wheel on the road. How Certainly. much of the 25 hours deals with that versus teaching people what the DMV motor vehicle handbook requires? Respectfully, sir, I, I, I want to add that there's another important dimension, which is the fact of the credential. So in this case, we seem to be lessening th this. What's being contemplated here is relaxing the requirements for attaining the credential. If there is a value in driver's education and public safety, the teachers, the operators, the owners should have to earn the credential for that privilege to 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 instruct uh, the, the, to operate a school in this example. Uh, so it, it, it seems as though this bill only relaxes the, the uh, commitments to public safety. Well, let me just make this one comment and then I will close my lips. Um, you know, I'm a pilot, I fly. But I don't need to be a certificated pilot to teach ground school under the Federal Aviation Administration ground school rules for pilots. I don't have to have one hour in the air, but I can teach the ground school. And so my questions were trying to get at why it's a thousand or two thousand hours for somebody to teach what is equivalent of a driving ground school. And I'm not sure that I really understand the difference. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none. Um, oh, that's. Uh, Senator McGuire has a question. Go ahead, Senator. Quick comment. Thank you so Go much, ahead, Mr. Please. Chair. Uh, and do appreciate the author bringing this forward and uh, for the testimony here today. I, I do think that um, it is going to be important uh, as this moves along to try to engage uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, know that it could be a challenge at times uh, getting the engage early, um, but I do think that is going to be an important piece as uh, I would have Soon, this bill is moving forward is to be able to try to get them to weigh in on it because um, it's important, uh, obviously, in the training aspect. And I think the senator brought up a really good point in regards to where they're at. Uh, that said, big agency and slow to respond. So I do appreciate, I know that uh, there has been some requests out, but uh, still a work in progress. So I do hope that we can uh, continue to push them to be able to weigh in on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, other senators? I see none. Assembly one, would you like to close, please? Respectfully request an aye vote. Thank you. Um, the committee recommendations for the amendments uh, <clears throat> and uh, approval with the amendments. Is there a motion on that? Thank you for the Okay, there's a motion. Hold the roll, please. The motion is due pass as amended and refer to the Committee on Appropriations. Senators Bell? Aye. Bell, aye. Canella? Aye. Canella I. Allen, Bates, Bates I. Gaines, Gaines I. Galgiani, Leva, Leva I. McGuire, McGuire I. Mendoza, Mendoza I. Roth, Roth I. Wachowski. Okay. That, that has eight votes and we'll leave it on call for other members to vote later. Thank you.